Yeah, I think that you may start your uh, presentations. And before that, you, you may be free to give a, self, a few a brief self introduction of yourself and uh, your talk. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tawa. Um, so good morning, I'm Leo Morabito, and I would like to thank the organizers very much for elevating my talk to an invited talk. Um, and that means I have a little bit more time. And if you saw my talk at Sparks a couple of weeks ago, this will be different because I, I have a little bit more time so I can cram in a little bit more um, science. Um, so the title of my talk is AGN Science with Subarc Second Imaging at Megahertz Frequencies. Um, you've probably uh, seen some of these re results by now. Um, they were in the news in August and uh, the papers have come out on archive already. Uh, but we're going to really focus on what LOFAR can do with subarc second imaging and uh, in particular with a focus on how it helps enable AGN science. So I've been catching up on the last session and uh, Shilpa actually set this up very nicely for me. Um, so I highly recommend going and watching her talk if you haven't seen it. Um, she discussed the difference between radio loud and radio quiet and what might be going on in radio quiet and radio intermediate AGN. Uh, so I'm not gonna cover this um, really, except to say that you can get radio emission from AGN on a very wide range of scales. Um, in today's talk, we will focus mostly on radio loud, um, but I think that LOFAR can help out with, uh, with radio quiet sources and we'll come back to that at the end. So I'd just like to take a moment to remind you why low frequencies are important. Um, and in particular at high resolution. So I have two figures here. Um, the one on the left shows you the canonical power loss spectrum that you get when you have uh, radio synchrotron emission, and then the synchrotron aging that you get um, as uh, the radio plasma ages. And it's to be able to understand what's going on and to pick out the spectral age of a source, you have to be able to model these curves. And in order to model these curves, you have to be able to model the initial power law and to do that, you have to go to low far, low far frequencies, really. That's, I mean, that's just basically how it works. Um, because without knowing what the initial power law was, you don't know how much you've aged away from it. Um, additionally, low frequencies are important for reaching the high redshift universe. So when you have um, spectral aging and then you get this redshifted, then it's increasingly important to go to the lowest frequencies you can so you can get the lowest rest frequencies that you can in high redshift sources. And this really, again, drives the need for, for LOFAR um, uh, frequencies. And I'd just like to point out that you can get turnovers at low frequencies from either synchrotron self-absorption or free-free absorption. And in order to capture those, especially for high redshift sources, you have to go to LOFAR frequencies. And all of this happens, but it happens um, in sources, but spectral aging and absorption don't happen globally across an entire source. Uh, you really need spatial resolution to pick out what's going on in different components of, of different sources. Um, so that's why you need high resolution, but at low frequencies to be able to really do spectral modeling. Otherwise, it's, it's not very meaningful. Um, so let's introduce the International LOFAR, and I'm doing this just to, to give you a feel for um, some of the, the, the LOFAR results you might see at this or other conferences, um, and how they compare to these new results I'm going to show you today. So LOFAR is an international um, antenna or international interferometer with stations spread all across Europe, and it's a continually expanding interferometer. Um, and if you use just the Dutch stations, which um, is what we do for the LOFAR 2 meter sky survey, um, although the data is recorded with all the stations, but currently we're only processing the Dutch stations, you get about six arc second resolution at 150 megahertz with the high band antenna. Um, and so we are conducting a survey of the northern sky with, uh, with the Dutch stations, um, and I really encourage you to see uh, Tim Shimwell's talk uh, in session 10. So the data release two paper is, has already been submitted. Um, data release two will come out, uh, we think early next year. It'll cover about 25% of the Northern sky with more than 4 million sources. Again, a resolution of six arc seconds, uh, mean RMS of about 70 microjanskis. And I'll just point out that almost 90% of the sources in lots at six arc seconds are unresolved, which means if you try to do the spectral modeling on any of those sources, the results you get are not going to be physically meaningful. But if you expand out to use the entire international array, you can actually beat the best ground based seeing you can get with adaptive optics for optical telescopes on Earth. And that's fantastic. So that's a factor of 20 improvement in resolution um, by just simply using the rest of the array. 
And what that gets you is that now you can start to resolve things. You can start to resolve radio jets in nearby galaxies. You can start to resolve uh, star forming clumps. So you basically get morphological information, which gives you spatially resolved spectral information. Um, you can reach fainter populations. You can access lower, um, lower uh, rest frequencies at high redshift. And also you have an increased survey speed um, compared to telescopes with comparable resolution um, at higher frequencies because LOFAR has a larger field of view. But this is quite challenging to do this high resolution imaging because you have to combine signals from dipoles all across Europe. Um, we have to deal with high data volumes, the fact that the uh, international stations are in independent clocks. Um, the correlator model has a lower tolerance for errors the longer your baseline gets. Uh, the ionosphere can be wildly varying um, across different countries. Uh, and one of the, the big problems that we've had to deal with is, is calibrator sources, because we need a list of calibrator sources, um, which are compact and bright enough on sub arc second scales um, at low frequencies. And that's not something that existed when LOFAR started. And I'd just like to remind everyone that not everything is a point source when you go to such high resolution, which means that your signal to noise uh, ratio goes down because your signal is going, to going down in a resolution element. So how do we deal with all of this? Um, well, the first thing that we need is we need calibrator sources. And the second thing we need is a specialized strategy to make use of those calibrator sources so we can actually calibrate the data. Uh, so we've been running the Long Baseline Calibrator Survey, which is now complete. Um, it finished uh, last year, not three months ago. Um, and there's about 30,000 sources in, in the catalog. Um, and these were selected at low frequency to be bright and have a flat spectral index, which indicates that they are likely to be compact. Um, we went out and observed them in groups of 30 with, with a very small bandwidth and uh, for a very short time. Um, and then the catalog itself gives you coherent statistics for each of those uh, calibrator candidates. So we get things like atmospheric coherence statistics. But more than that, um, we also can do things like look at interplanetary scintillation um, and cross correlated that with, uh, with the MWA, actually. Um, finding uh, similar results. And if you want to know more about this, I encourage you to go see John Morgan's talk uh, in session nine. Um, but we can also do a little bit of science as well. Uh, so we can test unification theory by dividing radio sources into quasars and non-quasars. And you can see that the quasars are always uh, smaller or more compact because they have a higher um, correlation statistic than uh, non-quasars, which is consistent with unification theory. The second thing we need is a, a specialized calibration strategy, and we've developed one for high resolution imaging at less than 200 megahertz, and this has been built on some VLBI techniques, um, but in a slightly different, uh, using slightly different software tools. Um, so it was designed as an extension of the LOTS calibration, um, and some of the key elements of this, this pipeline, which I'm not going to go into in depth uh, here, is that we solve for a dispersive delay and we also combine all of the core stations into a super station, which gives us a very sensitive station at the center of the array, which helps with our calibration. Um, and we do in-field calibration on LBCS calibrators. This pipeline is completely public. It's on GitHub. The link is on the, on the bottom of the page there to the right. Um, and then we've demonstrated this on a typical LOTS field. And the description of that is in, is in a paper that I've had accepted um, that will come out next year. So essentially how this works, um, just to give you a feeling for what the pipeline does, is we take a field, we locate all of the sources from, uh, from the LOTS catalog in this field. Um, and the, the field of view here is uh, denoted by a, this solid blue line. And it's about five square degrees. Um, things that are LBCS calibrators are circled with a, with a blue circle. Um, and then directions of interest, which were selected pseudo randomly to, to have a, a, a good spread of properties. Um, are the pink stars. So we determined, first of all, what our best in-field calibrator is, and it turned out to be this source. And so we go off and we do self-calibration on this source. We, do dispersive, we solve for the dispersive delays and then do self-calibration on top of that. Um, and then we end up with a nice image of this source. Uh, that's nice, nicely resolved. Um, and this is new information because this is unresolved in lots. So after that, we can transfer those solutions to the other LBCS calibrators and, and self-calibrate those, which then gives us uh, refinement of the in-field calibration in different directions. 
Um, we did test uh, a couple of sources outside the field of view. This one, which was quite bright, worked, um, but this one, which was a very faint source, did not. So we can extend uh, the self-calibration a little bit, but, but not in all cases. So that was a, a nice test to do. So after that, you can basically use these solutions to transfer to your directions of interest and image them. Uh, so to give you a feeling for the increase in resolution, because you can say six arc seconds, 0.3 arc seconds, but that doesn't give you a very intuitive feel for, for what you're actually getting. Um, this is actual data from actual sources in this field. This is the uh, how they look to the, just the Dutch array. And when you increase the resolution by using the full array, this is what you get. Um, so you can see here that this is a nice uh, FR2 galaxy with some hot spots, um, and you can see this wide variety of uh, structures. So across the field, we reach about 90 microjansky um, per beam RMS noise with a 0.3 by 0.2 arc second beam. Um, and the statistics on this is that it, take, it will take about 30,000 CPU hours to do about 100 sources, which is pretty reasonable. So now we're left with, OK, so what science can we do with this, right? Um, and really, I think the questions that we'll be able to, to work on with sub arc second resolution with LOFAR are what links galaxies and their AGN on smallest scales? Um, how and when were the most powerful AGN formed? So looking at the high redshift universe, um, how do AGN evolve to shape the galaxies that we see today? Um, and uh, there really is a need to resolve all scales. And although LOFAR probably won't get down to the nuclear scale for most of the sources that it sees, we're really looking at things that are kind of in the galaxy disk range um, where you can have a lot of interaction between the AGN at the center, which can produce outflows, can produce radiation and produce jets um, that have an impact on a galaxy and that galaxy's evolution. So we're really starting to probe down um, into the galaxy, whereas uh, radio surveys with, uh, with, with um, uh, larger resolution, larger resolution elements uh, are, are probably limited to uh, larger um, regions. And just to demonstrate that, here is uh, one of the sources from, uh, from that field that I just showed you the demonstration. This is what it looks like uh, in lots, and this is what it looks like when you image, go back and image using the entire international array. So you can really see we're seeing all of the structure on a subgalaxy scale. So I thought I would just take you through a few um, of our new AGN results at high resolution. Um, so we have a forthcoming issue in ANA. So we have 10 papers accepted. They're all on archive. Um, and then uh, the actual issue will be published in February, is scheduled to be published in February of 2022. Um, but this is really focused on the advances that we've made in high resolution imaging with LOFAR. Um, and I'd like to emphasize that this has been a team effort across an international collaboration. And a lot of the work has been led by PhD students. So a majority of the papers in this forthcoming issue um, have a, a PhD student as their first, uh, their first author. And this is just a, a collection of uh, some of the results um, that will be in this issue. So I don't have infinite time, but I will take you through uh, a couple of these results. Um, so the first one is uh, a, um, a paper on the origin of the ring structures in Hercules A by Roland Timmerman, who's a PhD student at Leiden University. Um, and so he used a combination of LOFAR and VLA data um, to make a spectral curvature map. And then this spectral, spectral curvature map, right? So the spatial resolution that you get, the ability that you get to get um, spectral information on uh, sub, uh, sub source scales allows modeling. And Roland used this modeling of the, the spectral behavior in different regions to pick out these rings and show that they're consistent with being deposited by inter intermittent activity. So that means that the, the, the AGN at the center is turning on and off um, on scales of a few thousand uh, mega years. I think, Roland, maybe you can correct me if you're in the audience. Um, but essentially, the AGN is turning on and off, and then you end up with these, these buildups of material in these rings. Um, so that's a really nice result. That would not have been possible without this low frequency um, spatially resolved information. Another one that's that's near and dear to my heart because I worked on this galaxy um, during my PhD um, is a look at the spectral ages and injection indices in a high redshift radio galaxy. So Fritz Feyen at Leiden University has been working on this. 
Um, so he took the, the LBA data that I made in my um, uh, PhD and then processed the HBA data and reprocessed some archival VLA data and was able to do spectral modeling to get the spectral age um, of this source. And one of the things that he showed in this paper um, is that the synchrotron aging losses are, are comparable to inverse Compton losses for this, um, uh, for this redshift, which has implications for what's driving uh, the Z-alpha relation. So, and this is just a very nice um, HBA image that he's made. So when I made this LBA, an LBA image of this galaxy, I set a record for highest resolution um, at uh, below 100 megahertz. And I'm very happy to tell you that that, uh, that record has now been broken. Um, so Christian Grunewald at, at Leiden University is working um, on, has been working on uh, the LBA, um, which is again, crucial to help anchor spectral modeling. Um, and he's been looking at sources, uh, bright 3C sources, um, to get their, their resolved substructure. Um, and he's got some, some really nice uh, spectral index maps in his paper um, and is able to do a little bit of science with some of these sources. So he's really pushing subarc second resolution down to, to 30 megahertz, which is absolutely fantastic. I mean, this is really going to be um, revolutionary for being able to do spectral modeling um, on a, a spatially resolved spectral modeling for these, these kinds of sources. Um, there are other uh, HGN results that I don't really have time to talk about um, today, uh, but just to give you a brief overview, um, so Jeremy Harwood and uh, Sean Mooney have looked at uh, the knots in the jet of 3C273 um, and done some, some modeling to compare different models of absorption um, in the knots. <clears throat> uh, Shruti Badol at Manchester has, has looked at doing gravitational lensing um, work with LOFAR. Um, so she's imaged a couple different lenses and confirmed that uh, what we see with LOFAR is consistent with higher frequencies, which is fantastic because LOFAR as a survey instrument will be great for picking out uh, gravitational lenses um, in, in, uh, in surveys. Uh, Etienne Bonacieux is, has um, done some uh, really nice work on 3C295, which you can see his image here, um, and then taken different regions, the hot spots and the lobes, um, and looked at different, uh, different models um, to, to see uh, where, um, to compare um, where absorption is, is happening uh, in, in this source. So is it in the hot spots, is it in lobes, because we know the overall integrated spectrum has a, has a turnover. Um, and he's finding that um, it's really happening in, in the hot spots. Um, Naomi Ramirez Olivencia has looked at ARP 299, which is a system of two merging galaxies. Um, so this one here, this, uh, this nucleus is actually a, a star, star forming uh, factory. Um, and in the nucleus of this second galaxy over here, you, you have an AGN. Um, and so it's thought that maybe this AGN is somehow helping trigger this, uh, this, this outflow um, that you see from, uh, from this star formation um, in the center of that nucleus. And Pranav Kukreti, uh, last but not least, um, has looked at 3C293. This is what the source looks like in lots, and he's managed to image the central nuclear region to get uh, a very nice images of the inner jets. So you can see you have these outer jets, which are much older, um, and then you have inner jets, which are, are younger. And he's been able to, to use this combined with archival information at the higher frequencies to, to use the radio SED to understand um, whether or not this is interacting with the ISM, and it is likely that, uh, that it is. So just to kind of summarize, what new science are we learning with these high resolution images um, of HEN? Um, and I, I think that what you can see in all of these studies is that the low frequency information is helping us understand jets and outflows. Um, and this in turn will help us understand accretion processes. Um, we can learn about things like their duty cycles, looking at, at sources where you have both old and young jets or looking at um, things like Hercules A where you can, you can see the effect of the AGN turning on and off. Um, we can also learn about things like how they're interacting with their host galaxies in 3C293. Um, and all of this is important to helping understand galaxy evolution. Uh, but what are the next steps? So I've showed you a, a collection of sources um, and th these are all fantastic results. Um, and the next um, step then is to kind of 
extend this to see if we can go wider to understand population statistics, to gather um, more information across lots of sources, to go deep to understand the faint population, and also to go low to really exploit the LBA, which will get, um, the, which will get the, a benefit from uh, the LOFAR 2.0 upgrade. Um, so going wide is something that we're, we've already started working on. Uh, so this is showing you a comparison of different surveys, resolution versus frequency. Everything's been normalized to the same sensitivity at 144 megahertz, assuming a spectral index of minus 0.7. Um, the size of the, the colored point in the gray circle shows you the, the amount of sky coverage each survey, each survey will have. Um, and by post-processing lots, we don't necessarily increase the, the sensitivity, but um, we do go down in resolution by quite a lot and still cover the entire northern sky. Uh, so based on the demonstration field, we expect more than 3 million sources to be resolved in lots uh, high resolution extension. So uh, I've been working with Johnny Pierce at the University of Hertfordshire. We're starting an H atlas. Um, so we have about uh, 30 fields that we're going to process. Uh, this is a collection of LBCS calibrators um, from the field that Johnny made. Um, and then we've been looking at the RMS noise versus radius and statistics of the, the self-calibration of these sources. This is just some selected uh, LBCS calibrators in the field and across all the different fields. And um, we can see that we get pretty decent uh, um, uh, self-calibration convergence um, within the, the field of view of the international stations, which ends about here. And then as expected, the noise increases outside of that. So really good promising results for, for starting to process large areas. Um, one of the other things we can do is we can go deep. I am not gonna say anything else about this because you should really go see Fritz Spian's talk in session nine. Um, he's been looking at the Lachman hole in, in the, as part of the lots deep fields um, and has produced a single uh, high resolution image of the entire field of view. Um, so that's five, five degrees squared with 0.3 arc second image uh, resolution across the entire image. It's fantastic and you should just go watch this talk. Um, what can we do with this kind of data in particular with the, 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 the um, Lachman hole field that, that Fritz has been processing? So I showed this at the beginning that shows you can get morphological information, yes. Uh, but one of the things that I'm working on now is um, using brightness temperature measurements uh, to, to see how we can separate the AGN and star formation, um, the radio emission from AGN and star formation. Uh, and so this basically relies on this, uh, this idea from, from Condon 92. Um, so these curves here are um, for a star forming galaxy. It's uh, the expected maximum that you would get from a star forming galaxy. Um, and this is flux density versus solid angle. Uh, flux density per solid angle versus frequency. Um, and anything that lies above these curves is not likely to be um, uh, produced by star formation. So you can see that we're already identifying some high brightness temperature um, AGN um, in this field. And this is for a very conservative selection of unresolved sources to start with. Um, but one of the nice things is that 34 of the, the 42 um, AGN identified this way are actually unique AGN identifications um, compared to the photometric selection um, that we then verify with detailed SED fitting. So Philip Best has done that SED fitting for the entire uh, deep fields, um, which gives you a really clean, if not complete AGN sample. Uh, and I've done this literally only based on the flux density and size information, um, no other information from, from uh, the catalog. Um, and now yeah. I'm working on pushing- Three minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, now I'm working on pushing the boundaries of this uh, down to see what, how far we can really take this, uh, this technique. Uh, one of the other things that we're working on is, um, is going low. So with the LBA, um, as I showed you the really nice results from, from Christian, but uh, uh, Neil Jackson is also working with John Matias and uh, Cyril and others at um, Nancé to um, see what we can do with, uh, with Nanufar, including Nanufar in the array is, as opposed to uh, the, just the Lofar French station. Um, these argon diagrams show you that Nanufar gets you a much more compact argon diagram, which in indicates higher signal to noise, which is expected because Nanufar is much more sensitive uh, than the, um, uh, the French station. So that's really promising. Um, we've been doing these, um, these tests using 3C147, so stay tuned for, for more news about that. 
So my summary is that uh, I hope I've convinced you that LOFAR can now routinely achieve subarc second resolution, both in the HBA and LBA. Um, we have a publicly available pipeline, so please visit the GitHub if you're interested in using this. Um, if you can run prefactor, then for LOFAR, then you can, you can run this pipeline. Um, I've showed you some new results on what are mostly jetted AGN um, and, uh, and how they're helping us understand the physical mechanisms in these sources. Um, and also that we're extending this work now to, sort to, to survey the northern sky. Um, we're doing wide area post-processing lots, um, doing really nice uh, work on the deep fields uh, led by Fritz Spayen, but also my PhD student, Emmy, who's starting on the Booties field, um, and another student at Leiden who started on the Elias N1 field. Um, and, and finally, we are extending this down to the LBA, so uh, that is something you can also look forward into in the future. So I'll just leave up this slide saying thank you to all of the people who have helped um, with all of this work. Um, and if I've forgotten your name on the slide, then uh, I apologies, but, uh, but thank you. Thank you for keeping time. Uh, very impressive. Uh, we have a couple of several speakers. Uh, the first one, uh, Cass. Hi, um, thank Hi. you so much. That was a spectacular talk, really incredible results. Um, you kind of touched on it a bit that one of the sources that I think one of the students was working on, they were looking at the absorption, spatially resolved absorption that caused the overall peak. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you've done any look at um, of the sources that you have that um, high resolution for now and you've, and you've resolved them out, uh, how many of them do show this, this peaked turnover and can you fit them onto like the Odea relation of, of their linear size to, to turnover frequency? Uh, that's a that's a good question. Um, so the sources where people have looked at turnover are um, 3C295, uh, 3C273, and um, 3C293. And I mean, Roland is also looking at the radio spectral energy distribution um, and looking at the spectral curvature in Hercules A um, with a specific scientific purpose. Um, so I mean, yes, you you can you can do this. I don't think anyone's um, started to look at fitting them onto the the turnover size relation. I mean, most of these are are quite low frequency turnovers, um, and uh, they're fairly nearby, and we can get lots of detailed information on the sources themselves. Um, so we can measure their linear size, right? And uh, and we know where the peaks are. So I mean, yeah, it, you you could put it on the on on that relation but i don't think anyone's done that cool okay um yeah awesome results thanks thanks well, next question you uh, anyone can raise your hand yeah joe yeah Leia. yeah awesome results just reiterating i just had a quick question in terms of like are you at the point of processing uh, the general lots data and i was just wondering how many fail going through the pipeline what's your success rate <laughs> of just like hitting pipeline got dot go and uh, now churning through the lots data. Yeah, so we're starting with H Atlas because that's about 30 pointings and that will give us an idea of the success rate. Um, so far, we haven't run into any problems with the fields, but we're, we've only processed the first two RA strips and we're not done with those yet. Um, so we're starting with the LBCS calibrators. So that's the, the work that I was sharing with, uh, with Johnny Pierce. Um, and um, that all seems to be fine. Uh, there do seem to be a couple of things that fail, um, but uh, that's something that we can, so you can see here that we have a collection of sources of LBCS calibrators that don't have as good RMS noise mm -hmm. um, as others, even though they're in the, you know, the field of view of the international stations. Um, so this is something that we need to build into the pipeline is to catch these sources. So we're not using them as in-field calibrators because they're, they're not great. Um, but this is kind of the point at where we're at. Um, so things are working. We have enough, enough sources that are, are good calibrators within the field of view um, for these first two RA strips, um, right. sorry, declination strips. So. Yeah, no, exciting. Looking forward to seeing those results. Yeah. Great, and John? Hi, Leah, really enjoyed your talk. It's really fantastic stuff. Can't tell you how excited I am about it. Um, my question was very quick. Um, do you have a rough idea of how many sources remain unresolved? I mean, this, this slide that you've got up is a perfect example. It looks like the majority of your sources show really, really rich structure on these scales. Yeah, um, so whatever number I give you is likely to turn out to be wrong when we observe more fields, um, because we're not quite at the point where we have large number of statistics on this. 
Um, and LBCS calibrators are a biased sample um, to begin with because they're selected, they're pre-selected because we expect that they might be compact at these scales. Um, but what we're finding out is that they're not necessarily. Um, so with uh, with um, the demonstration field, I imaged in, in 17 directions. Um, and of those, I think most were most were resolved. They had some structure. Um, Fritz might actually know what the, the statistics are um, from the Lachlan whole field, but I don't actually know off the top of my head. That's great. It's exactly the answer I was looking for. So yeah. uh, thanks very much. <laughs> okay, great. Mm, do we have other questions? More questions? Okay, uh, the time is uh, work, and we'll uh, first thank Leah, and then we'll move to the next speaker, uh, Eric. Yes, so this is all good, right? Yes. Okay, thank yes. you very much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Eric Ozega. I'm a PhD candidate at Leiden University. And uh, I will be opening this morning's cluster session with this study on ABLE 2256 with LOFAR all the way down to 16 megahertz. And I should reiterate, or I should iterate first time that this is very much work in progress. Um, so just keep that in mind. All right, since I'm the first one uh, in this uh, session talking about clusters, um, I'll just start with the uh, brief introduction so any cluster paper that you read will tell you that clusters are the largest structures that we have in the universe. And um, like many other structures in the universe, clusters actually grow through accretion of matter and through mergers with other clusters. And you can imagine that when the largest structures in the universe actually collide with the other largest structures in the universe. So when two clusters merge, this is a hugely energetic process. And uh, during this process of a cluster merger, actually, uh, yeah, up to 10 to the 64 ergs get released over a few giga year timescales. And most of this energy is actually dissipated into heating the intercluster medium. But some of this energy actually is also uh, dissipated in the form of shocks and turbulence in the cluster medium. And these shocks and turbulence, they can accelerate the relativistic particles in the cluster. And these start to glow brightly in radio, uh, start to emit synchrotron radiation that we can pick up with radio telescopes. So that's briefly uh, what happens during a cluster merger. And then what can we observe actually uh, when we look at cluster mergers? Well, we can sort of categorize this into three broad categories. Um, you, so you have uh, radio shocks, also sometimes called radio relics, um, which are these collimated structures um, tracing actual shocks in the intercluster medium where particles are being accelerated. Usually we find these on the outskirts of galaxy clusters. Then we have radio halos, these uh, large diffuse extended sources up to megaparsec sizes, um, which generally trace a turbulent region in the, in the center of a galaxy cluster. And the third term is sort of a, a catch-all term, um, which is tailed AGN, for example, head tail galaxies and clusters, but also dead AGN. So basically AGNs that have turned off a long time ago, but their fossil plasma is being re-accelerated by this uh, turbulent cluster medium. All right. So moving on to 2256, ABLE 2256 is actually a very good laboratory and to study all these processes um, because it actually hosts every, every one of these uh, things that I just mentioned. And it's just a very good uh, object because of um, the various properties that just uh, co-align very well for it. So it's, it's quite nearby which means that it's easy for us to pick up in radio. It's, it's radio uh, bright. Um, it's a complex merger. So there's multiple substructures actually um, merging with each other. Uh, it's quite massive. So there's lots of energy in these mergers. And we can actually see uh, a beautiful radio shock, radio relic here. Uh, you can see a very, very long head tail galaxy. And there's a couple of fossil plasma sources and other nice tails. And there's even a radio halo, although it's a little bit obscured in this image below the X-ray. Um, and because this cluster ABLE 2256 is so famous, such a good uh, like a study object, um, it's actually extensively 
studied all the way from a few hundred megahertz um, starting in 1976 up to um, optical UV and all the way up to X-ray. Um, so we actually have a very, very broad wavelength coverage of this cluster, except actually uh, below 100 megahertz, which is, of course, where I come in. Um, so this is the only image in the literature that is published um, at the moment below 100 megahertz of this cluster. And it's actually published by my supervisor during his PhD. So uh, this is the image that I have to beat, and then I hopefully uh, I will have a successful PhD. So this is how we are going to try to do this. Um, so we have observations actually at three, um, I split them into three filters, let's say. So we have the standard low far HBA observation from the two meter sky survey, which is just eight hours uh, at a mean frequency of 144 megahertz. And then we propose for 16 hours of observations in low far LBA to fill this missing gap, um, which I split for this talk into the 16 to 30 megahertz and the 30 to 64 megahertz. And here you can see the UV coverage of the, of the different uh, frequency ranges with the approximate resolution that we are getting um, afterwards. So starting with the LOFAR HPA image, it's a beautiful image of this cluster, which actually has not been formally published yet, although it's now in this submitted work by Kamlesh Rashpurit. Um, and it has already been floating around online for a while. Um, so you might have seen it already. Um, so this is just from the standard um, two meter sky survey pipeline with a, uh, with a separate um, extraction of the, of the cluster and then a couple of self-cal loops afterwards. Um, so basically standard also uh, properties, six arc second resolution and uh, 100 microjansky per beam noise level. Um, so here's new stuff. Um, so for the, for the 30 plus megahertz range, um, I could actually use uh, existing pipelines already. So there's also, a, a if you know, perhaps there's also a, a survey being done of the northern sky in low far LBA frequency, so around 40 megahertz. And with the low far LBA pipeline, with relatively little manual input, just uh, ironing out some, some uh, weird errors, I could actually get this image um, so with relatively uh, minor amount of work. Um, so it's a direction dependent calibrated image of the full field. Um, because the field is so large, I thought it would be a shame not to show you the full field of view uh, of, this, uh, of this, this cluster. And so for these frequencies, we get about 20 arc second resolution and we reach an RMS noise uh, of 1.4 Milijansky per beam. So this was quite, easy, I would say, still. And then we get to the sub 30 megahertz image, which is actually where I spent, uh, I think, 90% of the time that I spent so far on this project. So I'll just show you first the direction independent calibrated image of the whole field. So what we did basically after um, transferring solutions uh, for the band pass and the polarization and some flagging from the calibrator to, uh, to the target field, we uh, looked for the brightest infield source which is 3C390.3 in this case. And we use this as a, as a infield calibrator to, to calibrate this image and to get a direction independent image. And I mean, the quality is not very great, but for the fact that it's between 16 and 30 megahertz and it's um, direction independent image, I would say it's already quite good. And you can see that the ionosphere has actually been pretty kind to us. Um, where even some sources are still uh, very sharply detected uh, when we move away from the calibrator source. But of course, there are these larger and larger uh, ionospheric artifacts as we move further and further away. So to deal with these, we, I used a peeling scheme to basically, so I extracted the other bright sources in the fields and I self calculated in their direction. And then you can, uh, in the end, make a, a, a whole smooth screen over the entire region of the field of view um, with calibration solutions in different directions. And I'll just flip back and forward a few times so you can really see the major improvement that we can make um, with direction dependent calibration. And now the cluster is also not affected anymore by these giant spokes. Um, so that's really nice. 
and it gives us uh, in the end uh, an RMS noise level of uh, just short of nine millijansky per beam. Um, and we detect about seven sources per square degree uh, below 30 megahertz uh, with a beam that's uh, 40 by 20 uh, arc seconds. So that's very good. Um, since this worked so well um, and we've had another couple test fields, we actually decided why not do this for the entire northern sky, just like the LBA sky survey and the HBA sky survey. But for this, I'll refer you to this talk in session 11 uh, for more information. Because this is the cluster session, so let's focus on the cluster. So here are the final images uh, of above 30 megahertz and below 30 megahertz. And the image quality is actually really, really good. Um, if I had to guess that the left, the frequency range of the leftmost image, I probably wouldn't guess that this is below 30 megahertz. Maybe only uh, if you look at the resolution of the image, you could, you could sort of guess it. But yeah, the image quality is really, really uh, great. So we can study some of the objects in the cluster in a bit more detail, which is where I'll spend the second part of the talk on. So um, yeah, let's look at some of the objects uh, in a bit more detail. So uh, for example, we could take a look at the radio shock um, that is shown here. So we can make a spectral index map, of course. Um, I have to say <laughs> with any, low for observation, basically. Uh, the flux scale is, is uh, quite uncertain yet uh, still. Um, I haven't rigorously checked this yet. Um, I've done some quick tests um, where it seems that it's, it's, it's not horrible, but uh, just keep in mind, um, let's say a 20% uncertainty, is, which is what I assumed as well during this talk uh, on the flux scale. But um, we can look at um, actually the, the spectral index distribution within 20, and uh, 50 megahertz and 50 and 150 megahertz um, of the relic. And you can see that there is, there seems to be patches of flatter and steeper spectra, although I haven't done the rigorous analysis yet um, for whether this is real or whether this is maybe uh, just noise fluctuations. Um, but we also see this um, hint of steepening over the relic that was also recently seen in this paper by uh, Rashpurit that I mentioned before in the direction, um, yeah, basically to the, to the east of the, of the cluster, which can give us a hint on the um, direction of the shock because the relativistic electrons are um, thought to age actually in the direction perpendicular uh, to the shock. So um, we could take a look at the integrated spectral index as well. Um, we can split the shock into, into two regions, uh, as also done in this paper. Um, and we see then uh, between 20 and 140 megahertz that it's basically just a, a nice and flat spectrum with the spectral index of about minus one um, for both the components and for the total uh, relic. And uh, comparing this to some higher frequency data, the spectrum is actually just really flat. Uh, I think this is really cool to see that we now have data from 30 megahertz, two orders of magnitude higher to 3000 megahertz um, to trace the, the spectrum of this relic. And that we just see that it's just flat uh, between this huge range of frequencies uh, with the spectral index of about uh, minus one, minus 1.05. Okay. Um, we could also take a look at the radio halo, um, which you can see here on the picture on the right, this diffuse large structure um, in the cluster center. Um, for the spectral index map of the radio halo, um, we don't really see any um, trend, I would say. So we don't really see, for example, that the spectral index is steepening um, towards the edges of the radio halo. And um, I mean, there are some fluctuations, but they might be noise fluctuations. Again, I still have to um, look into more detail, uh, do a proper analysis of this um, before we can say something quantitatively about this. Um, but yeah, we actually detect the radio halo, um, a, a big part of it still down to 20 megahertz. Um, so that's really, that's really nice. 
Um, for the integrated spectrum, also for the radio halo, it seems really flat. Um, adding the higher frequency points as well. Um, we just find a, a steep spectrum halo actually um, with a spectral index of about minus 1.6, um, which just seems again flat uh, all the way from 20 to uh, 1.4 gigahertz, 20 megahertz to 1.4 gigahertz. So uh, an intermediate summary for the radio shock and the radio halo is that uh, we see that they both have flat spectrum spectra. Um, for a radio shock, this spectrum is consistent with a Fermi one type mechanism. So shock acceleration, basically of, uh, of uh, relativistic electrons. And the fact that the radio halo is so steep is consistent with the turbulent uh, reacceleration model. Um, there's more to be done, but there's there it's a uh, work in progress. For the, yes, for the final two minutes, I'll just highlight um, some of the other sources that we have in the cluster. So um, yeah, this is this is a, a marking of the of the sources. So you can see, for example, source C, this very, very long extended tail um, ends in these two sources or one source called AG plus AH. Um, which might be a fossil remnant source. And there's these three uh, sources called the F-complex, um, which also uh, are probably fossil plasma sources. So I'd like to see, uh, I'd like to show you what, what's going on there. Um, so actually what we're seeing, which was to me unexpected at first, um, is that the, the, the spectrum is actually flattening at uh, at lowest free, at the lowest frequency. So uh, naively, I just thought, okay, we'll probably see the steepest things at the lowest frequencies because they are the brightest. But I guess it makes sense that at some point these spectra have to start flattening. And this is actually what we are starting to see now that, now that we get down to the really, really lowest frequencies. We are starting to see really the the uh, spectra, uh, so the electrons that haven't aged a lot yet which is a bit clearer in the integrated spectral index um, where you can see that indeed the, the spectrum seems to be flatter between 20 and 40 megahertz than it is between 40 and 144 megahertz. Um, we can add a literature value as well because the cluster was also observed with the GMRT at, at 300 megahertz where now we can also uh, fit a broken power law spectrum. And you can really see now uh, clearly the difference between the flatter spectrum um, at 100 and uh, below megahertz um, and the really significant steepening after uh, 100 megahertz. For the F sources, um, it's basically sort of also unknown still what kind of sources they are, except for F3. So these three sources for, uh, for F3, there's an optical counterpart actually at the head. So uh, this one is uh, proposed to be a head tail radio galaxy, but for F1 and F2, there's no optical counterparts and they both show steep spectra at high frequencies. Um, I'll just skip this because it's basically unresolved. Um, so the integrated spectrum for these sources also show basically the same hint where, there, where there's a flat spectrum uh, which steeply curves as you go to higher frequencies. And I could only find um, higher frequency data uh, quickly for F2, but for this source as well, you can see um, that the, the spectrum really significantly steepens after a few hundred megahertz uh, when I add these uh, literature values by uh, Michiel Brentjes. So that's basically uh, what I wanted to show you today. So I've shown you that the final window that we have available to ground-based radio telescopes is now open for science. Um, the radio, radio, radio halo and the radio shock uh, both show very flat spectra. So there's this apparent sort of dichotomy between halos and shocks that just show integrated flat spectra all the way down to 30 megahertz, while fossil plasma sources actually show this this uh, break in their spectrum. Um, so this might uh, imply that there's, that, that at least the mechanism is not exactly the same generating these two different uh, classes of sources. 
Um, but yeah, there's much more to come. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions or uh, ideas what to do with this work. Thank you. Uh, Eric, I have a, very, a quick question. How, uh, how many uh, halos or relics do you have? And uh, do you have a statistic of the spectral index? Uh, how many halos and relics you mean? Yes. Uh, you mean like observed so far below 30 megahertz or? Okay. Uh, mm. I'm not sure I understand the question fully. Okay, I'll ask you in Slack. And okay, okay. You said. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, really neat. Um, fascinating to see this going down to this, these low frequencies. Have you had a chance to look at, at comparing X-ray emission and, and whether you're seeing the amount of X-ray emission that might be consistent with inverse Compton from, from the electrons that are producing the radio emission at these frequencies? No, I haven't. I haven't looked at the X-ray yet, but this is definitely something I plan to do. Um, but just there wasn't enough time yet. Yeah, thanks. Understood. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. So the uh, the time, uh, uh, Hank, and you, you have a quick question. Yeah. A quick question. Uh, very cool talk. Uh, interesting results. So I have a very short technical question. Why did you split the ABA data in um, two uh, different bands for the data reduction? Yeah. So this is basically because uh, because we have this this low far LBA pipeline already, which is made for sort of the 40 megahertz frequency range. So um, I decided to start with the 30 plus megahertz data and just put it to the pipeline and that worked quite well. But because the pipeline hasn't been tested uh, on data below 30 megahertz, uh, I decided to, to keep this separate and just uh, keep the analysis um, separate as well, because we just I mean, it, it's not tested for yeah. for okay. data below 30 megahertz. So you, yeah. you didn't even, as, so you didn't try to process as, as, as one chunk? No, no, okay. no. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, uh, yeah. We'll move to the next uh, uh, talk in, from Kenda. Um, yeah, uh, so, yeah Kenda's uh, just sent her, her talk in, so I'm just going to play it now, Tao. Yeah, Let me know uh, Kenda you... is also in the uh, yeah. online. Hi, everyone. So um, my name is Kenda Knowles. I'm a research associate at Rhodes University, affiliated with Sorero. Uh, and today I'm going to talk to you about the Meerkat Galaxy Cluster Legacy Survey, or the MGCLS. So um, this is an observatory-led program. Um, and uh, the work that I'm going to show you today, I'll discuss some of the data products and then try to get to a little bit of the science highlights. Uh, that we worked on, um, but this is very much a team, pro uh, team project that we're carrying out. And um, you can see the affiliations down there at the bottom. It's about 40 researchers, many of whom are South Africa, but uh, there are some overseas. So I'll just get right stuck to it. So first of all, I'm happy to say that uh, the main paper, the overview and highlights paper has been accepted for publication in ANA. It is now available. Uh, which means the data products are now available. And uh, here's the, the archive link and our link to our website where you can access everything through. So first of all, what is the MGCLS? If you haven't heard of it before, as I said, it's an observatory led program of observing uh, galaxy clusters between 2018 and 2019. Um, so in total, the, the first DR1 is 115 cluster targets spread out over the, the Southern sky. Everything was observed in L band. So nominal central frequency of 1.28 gigahertz. And these are long track observations, anywhere between six to 10 hours on source, and all observations were performed in, in full polarization. So of these cluster targets, it is a heterogeneous selection. Um, there's a sort of two subsamples, radio selected, where clusters were chosen because they had either been observed before for diffuse emission and, and found, or you know, not found anything. And then the other one is the X-ray selected subsample where targets were taken from the MCXC catalog um, and targets were, were selected to fill gaps in the observing schedule of Meerkat. So from the 115, um, we are dominated by low redshift clusters uh, and um, you can see the luminosity distribution here. So the main point of the MGCLS is that it is a legacy program. We are um, sending you know, data products out there uh, for the community to use. 
Um, and as I said, these are now public. You can access them on the DOI, but also uh, if you can't write down um, this link, then it's available through our website. So what are these D1 products? First of all, you've got the raw visibilities. So these are, when we say raw, we mean they're uncalibrated. And you can access them through the Sereo archive under the same proposal ID, uh, which you would put in uh, over here. Or you can, if there's a particular cluster that you're interested in, you can obviously um, use that to search as well. But for those who do not want to deal with raw visibilities and just want to get straight to their science, uh, we have provided some image products. So firstly, there's these basic image products. So these are full field of view, uh, which you can see here, it's about a square degree, um, or more than a square degree, actually. And the, the, the central noise is anywhere between four to seven microjanskis per beam in most cases. Um, the basic product is a 16 plane cube, uh, which is the standard format for Bill Cotton's MF imager. Um, and you have the total intensity plane, spectral index plane, and those two are co-fitted, and then 14 frequency planes. Um, so basically chunking up the wide meerkat bandwidth into 14 subbands. Um, you will notice in this image, perhaps, that there's no direction dependent calibration that has been applied. So around some of the bright sources, you can still see um, some direction dependent artifacts. Then, those are great for source finding, but if you want to do actual science, then you need primary view corrected images. And um, so we've provided these in the sort of in, in the enhanced block of images. And um, so these are primary being corrected. So you're getting the central 1.2 by 1.2 square degrees. And um, you can start seeing the effect of the, the primary beam here on the noise. But we provide these at two resolutions, the nominal resolution. So anywhere between 7.5 and 8 arc seconds and convolved to 15 arc second resolution. They also come in two flavors. So the first one is the five plane cube, which is total intensity and spectral index. And then also a frequency cube of 12 planes uh, because two of them are actually blanked due to RFI from the, the 14 I mentioned previously. So then those are the enhanced images and we've used these for most of the science uh, that I'll, I'll highlight in the, in later in the talk. And then finally, we've also provided a compact source catalog. So this is from all cluster fields. It's about uh, 620,000 sources. We used PyBSF for our source findings. So by compact, I mean those that were um, fit with a single Gaussian. We've done some flux density checks, and we find about a 6% difference between Meerkat and the scale in BSS and SUMS uh, fluxes. Uh, we have also performed some artifact excision because of the, um, the lack of Direction dependent calibration, and um, you do still have some artifacts. So we've, we've tried to remove those from the source catalog. Uh, and then we've also added value added catalogs for two of the clusters, ABLE 209 and 295, which are optically cross matched uh, using decals. So now that you know what the products are, what, what the sort of things you can do with them, well, first of all, Meerkat gives you excellent sensitivity on a wide range of scales. Um, and depending on how you deal with the images or if you're going straight from the visibilities, you know, there are many different ways that you can probe these. So here's an example of the central portion of one of the fields dominated by point sources. But if you know what you're looking for, you can see there are some sort of fuzzy regions there. Typically, if you want to improve your sensitivity to these faint sorts of regions, you will convolve. So this is the central panel convolved to 25 arc seconds. And now you run into the problem of source blending. Uh, because of the, the high source density with Meerkat and basically just the sensitivity, um, you boost the signal from, or rather the sensitivity from these uh, fainter extended patches, but they become very difficult to disentangle sometimes from the compact sources. So what we've done um, with, our, you know, for some of the science I'll show you, is we've applied a, a image plane filtering technique developed by uh, Larry Rudnick. Um, and essentially this is, as I said, it's, it's image plane scale filtering um, that allows you to disentangle the larger scale emission from the small scale. And so what you are left with um, after applying this technique is the, the larger scale diffuse emission. Then also with the wide meerkat bandwidth, you can do index, uh, sorry, in-band spectral index studies. So what we found is that you can get a reliable spectral index for any intensity of the signal to noise of 10. And what you see here is a lovely spectral index map of one of the, um, the bent-tailed sources in one of the cluster fields. 
then I'd mentioned that everything was observed in full polarization. What I forgot to mention is that uh, about 40% of the fields um, do have full Stokes images as well. So it's not just Stokes I, about 40% of them have Stokes Q and U as well. Um, and so you can do some polarization studies. We do hope to expand that to the, the full list in, in later data releases. Um, but what you see here is a example of a rotation measure map from one of the diffuse sources in the fields. And then finally, uh, there's been some very interesting work done on using this continuum data set to do some H1 science. Um, uh, there's been a group in South Africa doing this, and I'll, at the end of the talk, um, I'll show you some of those highlights. So yes, moving on to some of the science highlights. Um, so the next couple of slides, a lot of it is going to be from our main paper. Um, the archive link there, but there are some other additional follow-up studies that are, are being done, and so some of these are in different works as well. So the first thing I'll mention is diffuse radio emission, uh, sorry, rather diffuse cluster radio emission. Um, it's my main interest, and obviously with a lot of these fields, uh, we're going quite deep, we're picking up a lot of new sources, which is great, but we're also getting new views of sources that have been studied before. So here we've got the ABEL uh, 85 field, and in particular, so we find a new mini halo in the system, mini halo candidate, um, but also this Phoenix source that has been studied before um, at, at different frequencies. We're now seeing both the full, uh, sort of the large scale, as well as the, the beautiful filaments in the structure, all in one, all in one observation, which is quite amazing. And then in some of the other clusters, we're observing emission that we just don't know how to characterize in terms of the the current paradigm, which in and of itself is really interesting uh, to try and understand what's happening in these uh, complex environments. Uh, and then um, in terms of polarization, there's some really nice work um, that has been shown by Francesco de Gasperin. He's used the MGCLS data on um, one of the, the big ABEL clusters. Um, and what you're seeing here is obviously the intensity map, but this inset is a um, basically showing the, the filamentary structure um, of the source, but in polarization. So this is showing that the filaments here have different um, Faraday depths. So uh, basically here, we're looking at the, um, the first in good indication of there being 3D structure um, of the sort of the intertwined relativistic and, and thermal plasmas. So I, I would really suggest you go look at uh, Francesco's paper there. Then also there's radio galaxies. We can uh, never exclude those. And we're finding a lot of very, very interesting sources that I, I can't go and I don't have time to go into everything. But some of the highlights, um, stunning magnetic filaments in um, the ABEL 194 field, uh, some dying radio galaxy candidates that Nadim, um, Uziah and others looked at, uh, and also being able to, to look at the polarization structure of these um, sort of the diffuse uh, lobes. Um, remnants rather, if that's what they are. Uh, also some very complex sources that we're, we're trying to understand. So um, this is a, uh, a one source or, or possibly two sources in projection, we're not sure, um, that Larry has done another follow-up on. Uh, and then also we found some bulk motions uh, far from any known clusters um, by looking at these sort of what seem to be interacting um, tailed uh, or rather jetted galax uh, galaxies. And you can also look at star forming galaxies. So in the main paper, we've done an initial study on ABEL 209 um, and looking at the star formation rate and also the uh, far infrared radio correlation. So for the star formation rate, um, although we don't find a trend, you know, uh, with distance from the cluster center, what is really nice is that we're probing much further out, at least in the radio, than has ever been done before. Um, unless I've missed a paper, someone please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so we're going out um, beyond, you know, three times R200. So this work um, in the main paper was uh, heavily, I had one of our PhD students heavily involved. Um, and this Cabello, he's now um, extending this beyond ABLE 209 and including more of the MGCLS clusters. Um, so hopefully we'll get some really nice results from there as well. And then uh, we've also used the one of the data sets to look for high redshift radio galaxies. So we've used the ABLE 2751 field. Um, we've uh, done cross-matching with Deckels and Allwise. So this is in a, a gain in a separate paper. Um, and because of the wide bandwidth, we can look at, uh, at applying a, a steep spectrum 
ultra steep spectrum criteria. Uh, and this work was initially born out of an honors project. Um, and one of our master's students, Sina Banaka, um, has been heavily involved in this. And with this particular field, we found over 200 um, high redshift radio galaxy candidates, which still need to be followed up. Uh, but the, the cool thing to note here is that our spectral index coverage um, in terms of in-band spectral index is complete above uh, 0 0.3 millijanskis for, for this particular field, which is, um, I think, about an order of magnitude lower than uh, anything that's been done before at, at the same frequency. And then finally, I promised you some H1 stuff. Um, so these are just a, a few highlights that we've we've put in the, the main paper, and there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes. So hopefully you'll see more of this um, you know, in, in the coming months. But the, one of the most interesting things that they found with the, the H1, they looked at four different clusters um, to start with, and they found a, a new H1 group in one of the systems, um, looked at H1 mass distributions. But then this figure here is, is a really nice, um, I guess, just advertisement for um, doing commensal H1 and continuum data where you've got H1 intensity, velocity, but also um, being able to see what, what's happening in the, in the continuum image. So that's a, a whirlwind tour of uh, basic products, which you need to know about, and some of the science that we're already doing. Um, obviously, we are, you know, the MGCLS collaboration is still continuing to work on the data. We're always happy to collaborate, but, you know, the data is public, um, and we would really like people to go forth um, and, and use it for whatever the, their science is. Um, I guess you're you're only limited by your imagination. The stuff that I've shown you here is by no means an exhaustive list. So the important links just to leave you with the archive paper and then the website address and where you can access um, both the paper but also the, the data release um, and all the all the products from that. And uh, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Uh, great. And uh, if if anyone has a question, uh, Joseph. I have a super quick question. Is Kenda online? I think she is, right? Yeah, I am. Uh, <laughs> right. um, I was just wondering, um, you mentioned uh, Q and U products for some of the fields. Have you got uh, Stokes V products as well? Uh, yes, we do. Um, but I guess one of the caveats for those is that um, we're not really convinced that the, the V products are um, good for science, but they're, they're good for, um, I guess, quality testing. Uh, what's yeah, your uncertainty with the uh, V products? Have you got you got linear feeds on Meerkat or is it circular feeds? Um, they're, yeah, they're XXYY. So, yeah. Um, yeah the, okay. But what, what, what makes you uncertain about the V, the, the v being uh, not reliable? Um, I haven't actually worked on the polarization myself. I'd have to go dig into the paper. All that information is there, though. We've tried okay. to add as many caveats as possible so cool. people can get what they need. Yeah, I'll go and check it out. Thanks for that. Awesome talk. And Joseph, do you still have a question? Uh, if you're asking me, no, I was, I was yes, yes. applauding. I thought it was a good talk. Okay. Uh, another yes, also a great talk, Kenda. Um, a slightly related question there to Joe, but not about polarization, but are also the, the calibrated measurement sets available, for example, for re imaging at even different resolutions than you release? Well, unfortunately not. This is definitely something we want to have in, in next releases, but there were, um, so Bill Cotton at NRAO did a lot of the reduction and there were disk failures <laughs> at the NRAO um, and we lost a lot of the calibrated data sets. So unfortunately, no, those, those aren't available. Okay, bad luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do um, we have other questions? If not, and I will thank uh, Kenda's uh, talk again, and then we'll move to next speaker. Will you invite the speaker, uh, Rohi? Uh, yeah, I'll just share my screen.
Okay, can you see that in full screen? Yes, sure. Mm, please. Okay, sure. All right. Um, yeah, thank you to the um, to the organizers for uh, giving me a talk today. Uh, my name is Rohit. I'm a postdoc here at the uh, University of Edinburgh. And today I wanted to present some results uh, looking at the cosmic evolution of uh, jet mode AGN within uh, deep low far survey fields. So um, first, a little bit of sort of uh, motivation for why we might care about AGN feedback. Uh, so feedback from AGN is a key ingredient in cosmological simulations uh, and is often required in order to reproduce the observed properties of galaxies in the local uh, universe. Uh, so as an example, this, uh, the, the plot on the slide is showing the galaxy luminosity function where the uh, observations are given by the blue data points uh, and the solid and dashed black lines correspond to two different runs of a simulation with and without um, agent feedback switched on. And uh, as you can sort of clearly see, you need some sort of energetic input or heating source coming from the AGN in order to reproduce the sharp cutoff seen at the high luminosity or high mass end of the galaxy luminosity function. Um, so AGN can largely be broken down into two different modes based on their accretion efficiency. Uh, so the first mode of AGN uh, are known as radiator mode AGN, and these uh, are a class of AGN that are accreting matter efficiently, uh, so at high Eddington rates, uh, where accretion is thought to happen typically from cold gas. And so this leads to the formation of a standard accretion disk and a dusty torus-like structure surrounding the black hole. And as a result of these, um, as a result of these, these uh, sources also display um, high excitation emission lines in the optical spectra. Um, in some cases, however, these radio to mode AGN can also display uh, radio jets being launched from the black hole. And in those cases, these are then referred to as high excitation radio galaxies or HERGs, as I'll call them from now on. Um, the second class of AGN are known as jet mode AGN. And as the, the name suggests, these display powerful sort of bipolar radio jets being launched from the black hole. Um, and here, accretion is thought to happen inefficiently, so at low Eddington rates, uh, typically from cooling of hot gas. And uh, so these don't form uh, a, a stable standard accretion disk surrounding the black hole. And as a result of these, um, that also lack um, high excitation emission lines in their optical spectra. So then appropriately, these are also referred to as low excitation radio galaxies or or LURGs, um, as I'll call them. So um, these two AGN modes of populations have been studied in extensive detail in the local universe, uh, in particular by combining large radio surveys with uh, spectroscopic samples. Um, and uh, I just want to highlight a, a few of the key um, key results from from some of the some of this work uh, that are particularly relevant for later in the talk. So compared to the HERGs, the low excitation radio galaxies or LURGs tend to be hosted in um, more massive galaxies. Um, they have typically redder colors and also older stellar population. And compared to the HERGs, LURGs also tend to be found in richer group or cluster environments in the local universe. Um, we also know something about how these two modes of AGN might be fueled in their host galaxies. Uh, so this, uh, the plot on the slide is from Janssen et al, and this is showing the fraction of all galaxies uh, that host a radio loud AGN as a function of uh, stellar mass. Uh, so this is shown for the uh, lurks in pink and the hergs in black points. Um, and the really two key points that I wanted to take away from this plot is that uh, for the lurks, we observe a, a steep stellar mass dependence on the radio loud fraction. Um, and this is found to be consistent with accretion happening from uh, in an advection dominated flow um, via cooling of, of hot gas, as I mentioned earlier. Um, however, for the Hertz, uh, we find a much weaker dependence with stellar mass. And this, um, this is then associated with uh, accretion happening from the cold gas that's present in these, um, in these systems. So these are some of the sort of key host galaxy properties that we know uh, about these two modes of AGN. Um, and what I'm aiming to do with the rest of this talk is really extend uh, some of this analysis up to higher redshifts 
and in particular focusing on the low excitation radio galaxies or the LERC population. And so to do this, I'll be, um, I've been using the data uh, from the low far two meter sky survey deep fields or lots deep fields. Um, so lots deep fields is, a, uh, is the deep tier of the, of the low far two meter sky survey um, where we've obtained hundreds of hours of worth of imaging in some of the best studied extragalactic fields in the Northern sky. So these are Elias and one, uh, Lock and Hall and Bootes, uh, all at um, around 150 uh, megahertz. And earlier this year, we had the first data release um, and uh, where we reached a depth of RMS depth of around 20 microdansky per beam in the, the deepest field. Um, and we released a catalog uh, that contained over 80,000 radio sources um, across 26 square degrees over the three fields in, in total. Uh, so these fields were chosen because they have excellent multi-wavelength information across the electromagnetic spectrum. And so this also allowed us to identify host galaxy properties and counterparts for over 97% of, um, of the radio detected uh, sources. Okay, so uh, just to showcase the quality of the, of the radio data that we have uh, here, I'm showing the uh, deep uh, low-far image in the Elias M1 field with the uh, full moon uh, shown to scale um, with, some, with some cutouts where you can see that we, uh, we're clearly sensitive to the extended uh, classic AGN that you expect to see in radio, radio surveys, but uh, we're deep enough now to pick up large samples of these faint unresolved sources, which are likely star forming galaxies, um, um, uh, uh, which is also then useful for sort of doing statistical analysis for, for this uh, class of sources as well. Um, so what's really unique about the LOTSD fields is not just the depth of the data, uh, radio data that we have, but also the area that we cover. So to illustrate this um, on the slide, I'm showing a slice from the Millennium Simulation in the background. Um, and on top of this, I've overlaid in the white box, uh, the two square degree or so area covered by the Cosmos field. Um, so this field has one of the deepest, uh, 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 this field contains one of the deepest radio uh, continuum surveys to date. Uh, so this is from the VLA-3 uh, Cosmos 3 gigahertz large project, um, which reaches comparable depth to the lots deep fields. However, we cover uh, almost an order of magnitude uh, larger sky area. So the low far, uh, sort of a single pointing of the low far fields is shown by the, the yellow circle. And in the lots deep fields, we have three different fields uh, corresponding to essentially three independent sight lines. So uh, what this really means is that the um, lots deep fields allows us to get a uh, allows us to sample a much wider range of galaxy environments and also get a much better handle on uh, cosmic variance effects uh, in our in our lab analysis. Okay, so uh, as you'll know, the the radio sample that we have contains not just the AGN but also um, star forming galaxies, uh, and so. In order to in order to look at the uh, the LERC population and its evolution, we first need to separate these two classes out. Um, and to do this, we make use of the multi-wavelength information available in these fields uh, and perform SED fitting using four different SED fitting codes. Uh, so these are bagpipes, Agent Fitter, Segal, and MACFIS. Um, and we select our sample of uh, of LERCs by essentially applying two criteria. So the first is what we call radio excess AGN selection. So these are, uh, this is a criteria where um, we're selecting sources that show um, radio emission in excess of over three sigma compared to what you'd expect from star formation process alone. Um, and so this is done based on the correlation between the radio luminosity and the star formation rate as shown in the, on the right here. So this gets you a sample of all radio excess AGN or radio loud AGN. However, this consists of not just the LERGs, but also the, the HERGs uh, as both of these display um, radio jets. And so um, in order to separate these two modes of AGN population out, uh, we, we employ a second criteria what, that we call uh, the selection of sort of typical or optical AGN. Um, so this is based on the principle that um, for the HERGs, we expect to see emission from the AGN uh, uh, torus and accretion disk, uh, which we wouldn't expect to see for the, for the LERGs. Uh, and so to do this, we use Agent Vitter and Segal, both of which model the emission from Taurus and accretion disk in order to separate these two, um, these two modes out. So 
The combination of these two criteria then allowed us to select a sample of around 10,500 legs across the three uh, lots deep fields. So um, with this sample uh, of legs in hand, we can then finally start to look at the um, evolution of the of the leg population. So that is what's being shown on the on the in the plot on this uh, on the slide. And um, so this is showing the radial luminosity function of the leg population uh, after redshifts of 2.5. Um, and so it's shown in four different panels corresponding to four redshift bins. So top left here going from 0.5 uh, all the way to uh, 2.5 in the bottom right. And uh, our measurement of the luminosity function in the lots E fields is given by the solid uh, sort of uh, pink circles, uh, where we also compare with some other observations in the, in the literature. And uh, the really key point that I want you to take away from this plot, um, and it's a little bit hard to see on, on this slide here, but uh, it becomes a little bit easier if I overlay the luminosity functions in the four different retro bins onto the same panel, um, as I've done here, um, what you can clearly see is that the LERG population, uh, the luminosity function of the LERGs seems to show relatively mild evolution in the retro range that we study. And this then has interesting implications for the host galaxy properties and, and agent feedback, uh, because at the uh, near the start of the talk, I mentioned that from studies in the local universe, we expect these legs to be hosted in massive quiescent red and dead galaxies. However, the space density of these expected host galaxies uh, declines rapidly, especially beyond redshifts of one. And so um, if these were to be hosted in similar types of galaxies at high redshifts, you'd expect the luminosity function to, al to also show an evolution um, in, in line with the evolution of the expected host galaxies. Uh, but that's not what's actually observed here. So. To look at the to look at the uh, what kind of galaxies these lurks are hosted in high redshifts, we split our lurk sample into those that are hosted by quiescent galaxies and by star forming galaxies, and reconstructed our radial luminosity function. So that is being shown on the with the plot on this slide. So this is the same four redshift bins as I had in the previous slide um, for for the lurks, uh, where the black points now correspond to the luminosity function for all of the legs as in the previous slide. Uh, but now I also, also plotted uh, in the um, red triangles and the blue squares, the subset, uh, the luminosity function for the subset of legs that are hosted in quiescent galaxies and star forming galaxies respectively. So again, the two, two things that are sort of immediately obvious from this, are that uh, as we go to higher redshifts, we observe a significant population of legs being hosted in star forming galaxies uh, that's not been seen uh, before. And moreover, what we find is that beyond about redshift one, um, uh, the star forming lurk population began to dominate the space density, space densities um, for the lurks, but almost all of the radio uh, luminosities observed here. And so the, uh, the combined evolution of these two, uh, of the lurks in these two populations with the quiescent lurks declining um, and the emergence of the star forming lurks at high redshift um, can then explain the relatively mild uh, evolution seen in the overall lurk population in the previous slide. Um, so given that we have these two different, um, uh, these same type of AGN lurks being hosted in these two different types of galaxies, it's then worth asking um, in particular, high redshifts are then worth asking uh, how these AGN might be fueled in these different types of host galaxies. Um, so to look at this, uh, we extended the analysis from Janssen et al. that I showed earlier in the, uh, at the start of the talk at high redshifts using our data set. So the, the plot on the slide is showing the uh, fraction of lurks as a function of stellar mass for the quiescent uh, galaxies and uh, similarly fraction of legs as a function of stellar mass for the star forming galaxies in the right-hand panel. Um, but there's a lot going on on this, on, this, uh, on this plot, so I'll take some time to explain exactly what's, what's plotted here. So sticking with the left-hand panel um, for the quiescent galaxies, the y-axis here uh, actually corresponds to the uh, fraction of all quiescent galaxies that host a leg as a function of stellar mass. And similarly, in the right-hand panel, this uh, y-axis corresponds to the fraction of all star-forming galaxies that host a lurk um, as a function of stellar mass. 
And the different colored lines here correspond to um, the five different retrovins that we study um, in, in, each, um, in each of the panels. Um, and also to aid in comparison, the black dashed line here corresponds to, in, in both of the panel, corresponds to the steep stellar mass dependence that we observe in the uh, local universe uh, for the lurks uh, that Jans and Natal found. So what do we actually find from, from doing this analysis? So again, sticking with the uh, left-hand panel for the quiescent galaxies, we find a similarly steep dependence with stellar mass for, for the quiescent lurks. Um, and we also find that this relation shows relatively no, uh, sort of relatively little evolution uh, with redshift R to redshift of 1.5. And so what this uh, suggests to us is that the uh, quiescent uh, lurks are likely fueled in a similar manner to the lurks in the local universe. Uh, and that is by uh, cooling of hot gas within halos of these massive host galaxies. And that this mechanism must have been in place since at least about redshift 1.5. Um, however, what's more interesting is if we look at the star forming lurk population on the right, uh, we observe a much weaker dependence with stellar mass here. And so what this suggests to us is that there might be a different physical mecha mechanism that's fueling the lurks in these more star-forming galaxies. Um, and uh, we, we think that this might be due to, uh, this might be occurring from the abundant supply of coal gas that's already present in these more star-forming galaxies. And some evidence in support of this comes from looking at the, uh, the incidence of lurks uh, increasing as you go out to higher redshifts for a fixed stellar mass. Um, although a little bit noisy, um, when when the gas fractions were also also higher, and so we're mm -hmm. currently in the process. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm almost done. Uh, so we're currently in the process of trying to uh, obtain some follow, follow up observations to really characterize the nature of how these two different uh, um, how the uh, same type of region in these two different types of galaxies might be might be actually fueled. Um, so with that, I'll just end with the uh, with the summary um, that today I've just uh, talked a little bit about what the log deep fields are uh, and the first data release of this, um, which reached depths of around 20 microtons per beam, uh, containing a catalog of over 80,000 radio sources across 26 square degrees. And using this, we were able to identify a sample of around 10,500 lurks across the deep fields. Um, looking at the evolution of this lurk population using luminosity functions, we found that this shows relatively mild evolution up to redshift of 2.5. Um, and we found that this was due to the emergence of a, a significant population of star forming uh, galaxies that host a lurk at higher redshifts. Um, and looking at the host galaxy properties of these star forming lurks, we find evidence for potentially different physical processes that trigger or fuel the AGN in these more star forming uh, galaxies compared to their and counterparts. Uh, so with that, I'll just end and happy to take any questions you have. Google. You hope you, you may unmute your microphone. Yeah. Hi, Ro. It's a very, very nice talk and very, very nice steps. Could you show me the slide before the summary? Sure. Because uh, I'm a bit puzzled here in the sense that if you think about radio luminosity functions, we know that there are a factor of 100 more radio sources at high redshift compared to low redshift. And one way of interpreting that is to say that uh, the ones that have fairly small stellar mass should become much more active. And in a, in a paper which we called uh, When the Little Ones Were Monsters, Wendy and I tried to look at this. And if I now look at this plot, I don't really see this. But I'm wondering whether that's because if you, you for the higher redshift ones, you're not really probing the, uh, the lower stellar mass ones. Is that the, uh, the way to look at this? Um, so... I think in some sense, yes. So the the um, so there's a the stellar mass completeness limit applied to the plots that I've that I've plotted here, and as you can you can sort of see the the points for so the highest redshift event don't really go down beyond uh, beyond sort of three or four data points here. Um, 
And I think this is down to the, the number of sources that we have uh, available. So um, I didn't have time to go into the details, but this, this plot currently is for one of the deep fields only. Um, and I'm trying to update this, this plot to include all of them, which will help a little bit. Um, um, but uh, I suspect that's probably why, if I've understood what you're saying correctly. Okay, because so, yeah. Again, I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah, no, uh, thanks for the answer. Yeah. Rolling. Hi, yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, great talk, really loved it. Um, I was wondering if there's uh, any plan to, for instance, uh, study this with respect to their environment. Uh, for instance, I can imagine that this, ho this whole process will work differently in, for instance, a group versus a cluster and, and where the galaxy is within a cluster, if it's like a BCG or, or some other galaxy that's uh, orbiting the cluster. Um, are there any plans for that? And if so, have you perhaps any expectations for that? Um, so I, I think that would be really interesting to do. Uh, yeah, you're, you're clearly right. So it would be really interesting to see how this depends on with the environment. Um, um, I don't have any plans for that, but I think there are people within the, the low fast service team who are planning on looking at sort of the dependence of radio AGN activity with with the environment. So um, I think it'd be it'd be interesting to to look at that. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Okay, I think that the time is well kept. Uh, so yeah. we thank uh, Rohit again, and uh, they mm -hmm. will move to the next speaker, uh, Rosella. Yes. Start sharing the screen. Okay. Uh, Planck cluster in the low fast sky. Yes. Yeah, please. Okay, everybody. So I'm Rossella Cassano from the Institute of Radio Astronomy in uh, Bologna. And uh, uh, today I will going to present a work that is called the Planck Cluster in the Lofar Skies that uh, I done in collaboration with the Lofar Survey Key, Pro Key Science Project within the Galaxy Cluster Working Group. So it's really a work that uh, was made uh, by a lot of people. So, um, okay, so this is the outline of the talk. I will just uh, briefly introduce cluster scale diffuse radio emission galaxy cluster, and uh, uh, I will focus on what is the present view that we have that comes mainly from statistical study at gigahertz frequency. Then I will uh, very quickly uh, mention the LOT survey and the DR2 uh, data release. And, and then I will go to the project to, do, to discuss the plant cluster in the LOTS DR2. And uh, I will briefly mention the numbers and classification of the sources that we found, and then go, go to, through the statistical analysis of uh, mainly radio halo in lots DR2. And that is still in an in, in ongoing process, uh, but uh, yes, we already have uh, preliminary results to show. So a galaxy cluster, we know that galaxy cluster form via the archaeological sequence of merger and accretion of smaller system driven by the dark matter of the, of the halo. And uh, we know from simulation and from theory that major drive turbulence and shock in intercluster medium, and that turbulence shock can power mechanism of particular acceleration in intercluster medium. Uh, what we found is that when we uh, look at the cluster in the radio band, essentially you see uh, non-thermal phenomena that are uh, radio relic at the cluster periphery and radio halo in the, the cluster center. Uh, what we believe actually is that uh, radio relics are related to, to, to shock uh, in the intercluster medium, so reacceleration by shock, while halo uh, trace turbulent region in intercluster medium where particles are trapped and reaccelerated during merger. So all these phenomena pose fundamental question. First of all, about the origin of, the, of this component, but also about the impact that this component may have on the thermal intercluster medium and also on the cluster dynamics. So uh, in this talk today, I will focus on uh, radio halo. What we know about radio halo so far from statistical study, I mean. So uh, what we know is that when we observe at uh, gigahertz frequency, or let's say 600 megahertz frequency, that was one of the classical frequency with the GMRT, we found that uh, the, if we put the cluster in the radio power versus mass diagram, we found that radio halo follow a nice correlation between the radio power and the mass, but the majority of the cluster that we observe in the radio have, have no diffuse emission, and they, they live in this region of the diagram, this radio quiet region. 
when we look at this cluster in the X-ray, we can derive uh, morphological parameters, mainly the uh, C and W in this case. This is the concentration parameter and the central sheet parameter. These are derived from the X-ray image and tell us about the dynamical status of the cluster. So in this plane, we can, oh, sorry, we can recognize the place where merging clusters are located and where relaxed clusters are located. And so essentially we see that the majority of radio halo are in merging system and radio quiet system are in general relaxed system. In addition to that, we also found that the fraction of cluster with giant radio halos increases with the cluster mass. And this is, was proven for a very massive system. So actually um, cluster with mass larger than five, 10 to the 14 solar masses. We don't know what happens at the smaller masses here. And uh, uh, so these observations together tell us essentially that uh, are, are in line with the, the picture that we uh, believe today can explain the presence of radio halos in galaxy cluster. That is the turbulent acceleration that uh, happens during merger. Essentially, in this case, the mass of the system, involved systems, uh, sets the energy budget that is available to reaccelerate relativistic particles. So, uh, but the question is how much the present view is biased? Why it could be biased? Because we, uh, th this observation comes mainly from high frequency and also our uh, observation that we have mainly from high massive cluster. So this is the same plot as before. So the radio power versus mass diagram for radio halo, where I also put to uh, overlap the, um, the mass function of galaxy cluster. This is to see that essentially with present observation, we are sensitive mainly to very massive system that are all a very small fraction of the class that we have in the universe. So there is here in an explored mass range where the bulk of the cluster in the universe are located and where uh, serving with low far in the future also with SK1 low can really um, help us to, to, to highlight what, what we really is there in that cluster. So can allow to explore this uh, this, uh, this mass range where are located the bulk of galaxy cluster. In addition to that, uh, in the framework of the, of the present scenario, um, galaxy uh, radio halo are characterized, should be characterized by a synchrotron radio spectra that have a steepening at very high frequency. And the presence of uh, the, the position of these steepenings is related to the efficiency of the mechanism of the acceleration mechanism. So what we believe is that today, we are uh, with the gigahertz frequency, we are sensitive to, uh, to, um, to very efficient phenomena that are essentially uh, very energetic merger. So merger between very massive system. While at low frequency, there is an explored range of uh, synchrotron spectra where we expect to found essentially radio halo generated during less energetic phenomena. So for example, merge between less massive system. So uh, for this reason, uh, we believe that the present, uh, the present view of a galaxy cluster can, can have some bias. Um, so the low far to meter sky survey that will be a talk by, by Shimuel in this, uh, in this conference uh, also on that, but here just to briefly mention that uh, this survey is actually the, the most sensitive and high resolution survey that we have uh, in this frequency range. Uh, and that uh, is really suitable to, to study diffuse emission in galaxy cluster because of the combination of resolution and sensitivity. And also because uh, uh, there will be, um, it will be um, a survey of all the northern sky. So a very large survey that is important to have large area when you study galaxy cluster because galaxy cluster are um, very rare uh, object in the universe. So you need a uh, very large uh, area in order to study them. Uh, it's so far we have the, the first data release of, the, of this survey that is um, this uh, uh, yellow rectangle here. So a very small uh, fraction of the sky. Uh, and now soon we will have the second data release that is uh, uh, 13 times larger than the first one. And uh, um, Okay, sorry that I would like to keep this. Okay, um, is a is a larger than the, the, the first one. So uh, there is also an improvement in the pipeline, in the source fidelity, dynamic range, and actually it covers uh, the uh, twenty seven percent of the northern sky. So it's a quite good area to start looking at the galaxy cluster with the statistical uh, study. Okay, so. Um, 
going on. Uh, so this is uh, our project. We, we start to study, to investigate the presence of plant cluster in the, this lots DR2 area. We found about 300 cluster, PS2 clusters in the DR2 area. And uh, the bulk of them have information about mass and redshift. Here you see the plot mass redshift where the blue points are essentially the, um, the, 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 the cluster with the mass information and redshift in the DR2 area. And uh, uh, another important point is that the majority of these classes, the great majority of them, have X-ray data, Chandra or XMM archival data. And this is also important because we would like to uh, investigate the connection between the presence of radio halo and the cluster dynamical status. So we can really say that this is the largest statistical study of diffuse radio emission in galaxy cluster with deep low frequency radio observation. Uh, what is important also here to stress is that with this kind of observation, we are starting opening a new uh, window in the mass and redshift uh, um, range. Indeed, this is the distribution of this cluster in mass and redshift. And you can see that with respect to previous study, we are starting to investigate also less massive system and high redshift cluster. Uh, once again, I would like to stress that this, this is a very uh, large collaborative effort. These are the faces of people, many involved in this study, but there are also other people. And uh, uh, we, these people are located mainly in, uh, in, uh, in three countries, in uh, Italy, in uh, Germany, and in the Netherlands, where also the cluster working group chairs uh, are located. These are the list of papers that we are working on and that will be uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, published soon. And uh, uh, in this talk, I will, uh, uh, I will um, focus on this first three paper. So uh, going on, okay. First of all, uh, I would like to say that the image quality that we produced during uh, uh, this, uh, um, the, this effort uh, um, to produce image of this cluster um, is uh, slightly better that, uh, than the R2 release because uh, each cluster was reprocessed and to improve the calibration toward its direction. And uh, we produce also a number of images uh, to, to make the cluster science essentially. So we produce uh, uh, high resolution images. You, you can see here for, uh, for one cluster, the number of images that were, reprodu were produced in order to, to study the, uh, the detail of this diffuse emission. And um, so you have high resolution, you have uh, uh, different kinds of uh, 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 resolution with and without uh, compact source attraction. Then we produce also image of uh, overlay with the optical and with the X-ray when X-ray is available. So all this is important in order to classify the diffuse emission that we found in the class. And the, the classification task was not an easy one, I will say. Uh, maybe this, this is because also we are at low frequency and the, uh, the, the sources that we found in the radio get very complex, but yeah, th this was not an easy task, I would say. So there are simple cases in which you can easily recognize the, pre the, recognize the presence of radio halo or radio relics, but there are also very complex cases. So in order to make this process as possible, uh, as objective as possible, we, we, make, we make use of a classification tree. And uh, for people of us, among us, uh, make their own classification. And then we try to, to converge when there are some... Uh, um, uh, some discrepancy in the, the classification uh, uh, and when we end up with different classification. So it was a very long process. It took more than one year, I would say. And uh, essentially with this classification tree, uh, help you to, uh, to be uh, objective. So you answer to, to some question and you can end up uh, uh, depending on the, uh, your answer in, uh, in the different kind of uh, uh, radio source classification. So you can end up in, end up in no diffuse emission, you have radio halo and relic, you can have candidate radio halo and candidate radio relic when uh, the X-ray emission is not available. Uh, you, have, you can end up also in uncertain cases when, for example, uh, there are artifacts uh, in, the, um, in, the, in your uh, image or uh, there are... Um, um, how to say, uh, residual from uh, subtraction that you can actually uh, trust, which is uh, the true diffuse emission and which is not. So we, we believe to be, con we, we want to be conservative and call it these sources uncertain sources. And then we also, we have also unclassified the emission. This is when essentially uh, the quality image is not so good. So we don't use this for the classification. 
So these are some numbers, a fraction. So uh, you see that here that about half of the cluster in the sample that does not host diffuse emission from the intracluster media. So it's a diffuse emission that cannot be attributed to the uh, AGN. Then, and these sources, uh, uh, this cluster are, however, very important for our study since it will be used to, for the computation of the upper limits to the, depress, to the presence of uh, diffuse emission. Then we have uncertain sources and we have radio halo. 73 radio yellow and relic. And uh, I will say that about half of these sources uh, uh, have a new discovery. So this also a very important uh, uh, point that we will come back later on that. So the statistical analysis, in order to make a statistical analysis of this huge sample, you need to, uh, you need to, um, to consider a selection function. So this is our plant cluster. And we know that uh, there is a uh, Planck, Planck give us the, the completeness of this, uh, uh, of this cluster. For here, for example, I report this 50% uh, completeness line. That, that means essentially that where you, when you are very close to this line, you have the 50% probability to uh, that the hey. cluster is there, essentially. So Hello. It is important to consider that in your uh, in your calculation, essentially. So um, the, the five fifty percent completeness is not so large completeness, but uh, indeed we we want to be uh, how to say uh, to search a compromise between to have a large statistic on one way and to be as complete as possible in order to to believe the tower number that we are going to derive are really uh, meaningful so we can make science with that. So we trust on this 50% also because, uh, and this is a very important point, uh, Planck people in, uh, in, uh, in their paper make uh, a simulation of uh, um, cluster with different disturbance, so with merger system, relaxed system, and find that there is uh, uh, no, no significant difference between the completeness function that you can derive for merging cluster and non-merging cluster. And this, this allows us to use this 50% 50 com 50 completeness line to make our statistical investigation. Um, so as a first step, we would like to, uh, to search, to compare, we compare our sample, what we found in our sample with what is uh, already published uh, from uh, um, previous uh, work, uh, in this case with the Cuciti uh, this year, uh, where ex essentially very massive system, so at, at uh, masses with larger than 6, 10 to the 14 solar mass at up to Reshi 0.35 were observed at uh, high frequency, so with the GMRT 600 megahertz. Here, the fraction of cluster with radio halo was found to be of the order of 41-48%. In the same region of parameter space with lots, we found 60-70-73% 70, 70, uh, of cluster with giant radio halo. So we found an increase of the fraction of cluster with radio halo as a function of the, uh, of the frequencies going at a low frequency. So is this in line with what we expect from theory? I will say yes if we compute in the framework of the current model, so current scenario in which uh, HALO are producing du during, uh, during merger, essentially, you can uh, derive the fraction of cluster uh, as a function of the mass at a different frequency. So here at the low, uh, at a high frequency and low frequency, and we end up with the 44%, 45% uh, at 600 megahertz and uh, 67 percent at, uh, um, at the low frequency. So you find that these numbers are quite in line with what we uh, are observing in this survey. Another point is uh, which is the occurrence with the cluster mass. So in order to derive the occurrence of radio halo with the cluster mass, since we have uh, um, a, quite strong uh, a quite strong function of the distribution of uh, uh, cluster with the cluster uh, with the, with redshift, as you can see here, we can, uh, we, can we split our sample uh, in three redshift bin, and each redshift bin was split in two mass bin. So we have low mass bins and high mass bin, and in each of these bin we compute the fractional cluster with giant radio halo. And you see that in each redshift bin, we found that the fraction of cluster with giant radio halos increases going from low to high massive system in each bin. So this means that there is uh, an increase of the fraction with the cluster mass in different redshift bin. And uh, uh, how this can be compared with model? 
Again, here is the, we, I reported the fraction of class that has a function of different trash bin. These are in the low mass bin and the high mass bin. So the, the red region here are from observation. And what we obtain from theory are this black line here. And you can see that also in this case, we have, we have a good match between model and what we actually observe in the survey. Um, another important uh, aspect of this work will be, as I told you before, the uh, analysis of the um, essentially the morphological parameter of, uh, of this cluster. So in order to study the connection between the radio halo and the merger. So uh, in this plot uh, that is always the same mass versus redshift plot, uh, I report with the color code, there is the classification and uh, the, uh, the classification that was made in this case, just for the cluster that has information about the X-ray. So the empty uh, square here are those clusters for which we don't have X-ray information. And you can see that uh, if in the total sample, so considering also the cluster uh, without X-ray information, these are the relative fraction of cluster with halos, with the, without the diffuse emission, with the relics and so on. In the morphological sample, so let's say the sample for which we can derive the information about the cluster morphology, so essentially the, uh, the, the sample with the X-ray data, these are the relative fraction. So these are not the same, of course, but they are, they are quite similar. So we can use this, uh, this sample in order to make some, uh, some statistical analysis on the radio halo merger connection. So again, we derive here the, uh, we plot the cluster in the morphological diagram where you have here the concentration parameter and the centroid shift derived from the X-ray. So you see here is the region of the merger and here is the region of relaxed cluster. So going from here to here, this is a, a sequence of systems that be, uh, become always more and more uh, disturbed, dynamically disturbed. And uh, in the plot uh, um, here below, you can find essentially the distribution of cluster according to one of these parameters. So according to the concentration parameter and according to the W parameter. So what you, uh, you can immediately see by looking at, uh, at all this plot is that the fraction of cluster with radio halo increases going towards more dynamically disturbed system. You can see this in every of these uh, uh, panel here. And also that the fraction of cluster without no diffuse emission seems to increase moving in the other direction. So going from uh, more, uh, more disturbed system towards a more relaxed system, essentially. So um, another important aspect is to analyze the uh, presence of correlation between the, the radio power and the mass of the cluster. So um, here again is the radio power versus mass correlation. This time is the radio power 150 megahertz. And uh, uh, what we know uh, here, the, the big improvement that we have here with respect to previous study uh, at high frequency, because uh, already uh, Reinhardt published the paper uh, uh, from uh, um, the ATLEX field in which there was a correlation between radio power at 150 megahertz and the mass uh, and was uh, already extending uh, uh, the sample uh, at very uh, low massive system. So but previous studies so from gigahertz frequency were limited to very massive system. So now we have the potential with LOFAR to extend this study going to very uh, low massive cluster and uh, where there are the majority of cluster in the universe, of course. And you see how many points we have in this plane here. And what we found with respect to previous study is that there is an increase of the scatter of this correlation. And uh, uh, what we, uh, we believe is that the cluster from theory essentially move in this plane, essentially the scatter are telling us this, from the, from the region of the upper limit during the left time when there is a merger, they move up in the correlation and then they will come back in the region of the upper limit. So there is a sequence here of, um, that, that, that we expect from the theory. And uh, is this in line with what you observe? One possibility to check this is to check if the scatter of the correlation is related to the dynamical status of the cluster. And this is what we, we obtain. Here is a, the, uh, essentially the distance of this point from the correlation above the correlation and below the correlation as a function of the morphological disturbance of the cluster. This was something that we already start to look at with, uh, with Virginia Cuciti in a paper published uh, this year, but now we have more statistics. 
And we started finding that this uh, is really the case. So we found that the more uh, clustered that are more disturbed are scattered up in this correlation. On the other hand, clusters that are more relaxed are scattered down. So there is indication that the scatter is contributed by the morphology of the cluster, essentially. Um, so mm -hmm. another, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks. Uh, another important point is how many radio halo are we discovered in full lots? Now, now that we have the information about uh, what we found in the DR2, we are meeting to extrapolate this number to the full survey. And you can do this exercise in two ways. One possibility is to use the fraction of cluster with giant radio halos that we measure in the DR2 area. And then we know the number of plant cluster that will be in the full lots. And you es essentially derive in this way uh, the number of, class, of cluster with giant radio halo that you expect in full lots. And you end up with 260, 400 radio halo in full lots. Uh, another possibility is to consider the number of cluster with radio halo that you have in the DR2 area and then correct for the, uh, the ratio of the sky coverage between uh, the DR2 area and the lots area. And you end up with a number between 300 and 450 radio halo in full lots. As you can see, this number is essentially in line with each other. And these extrapolation are in line with model expectation, which give us a number of between 350 and 500 radio halo in full lots. This was from previous published paper. And uh, um, another important information to add here is that uh, what uh, I already told you before, about half of the halo that have been discovered in the DR2 area are new discovery. And uh, on th this, in, in addition with the fact that uh, uh, models imply that about half of the halo that are expected to be discovered in lots are expected to, be, uh, to have very ultra steep radio spectra. And uh, so if we, uh, with follow-up observation, we confirm that the new discovery or that the half of the halo that we have in the survey are uh, ultra steep spectrum radio halo, this will be another very important test for this model. I will say that again, we start to make some of these um, analysis. This was done with the follow, uh, ULGMRT follow-up of a redshift cluster discovered by LOFAR. And uh, we found in that paper that about half of this halo have ultra steep radio spectra. And that this was already in line with this uh, expectation. Uh, so my conclusion, the search for radio halo and radio relic in the 300 Planck uh, cluster in the lost year two area is the largest statistical uh, work done so far in cluster with the deep and uh, deep low frequency radio observation. Uh, we found hundreds of radio halo and relic, um, and half of them have new discovery. The occurrence of radio halo increases at a lower frequency and also increases with the cluster mass. Radio halo are found preferentially in merging galaxy cluster. We found also that the radio power of halo increased with the cluster mass, and the large scatter of the correlation is related to the cluster dynamical status. Uh, finally, the extrapolation of the DR2 observation to the full lots allowed to, uh, to estimate that about 350, 450 radio halo awaited discovery. And uh, I will say that uh, all these, uh, uh, these results that we, are, uh, obtain that we have obtained so far are in line with the current radio halo scenario. And that's it for me. Okay, a very impressive talk. Uh, questions Thanks. and or comments? Oh, uh, yeah, very nice to see. Uh, if I look at your plots, do you think that uh, uh, the fraction or the number of relics goes down with the redshift? Uh, you, you mean, uh, I, I, I'm talking about ELOS. I know, but you also have those plots with relics on there. Oh, let, let me show what you... Uh, blah, 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 blah. Which, uh, which plot do you mean? There's a plot where kind of like uh, uh, radio power versus redshift, and then you classified things in halos and relics. Okay, but was not with redshift. <laughs> I thought it was with redshift. Oh, let me let me share again. 
Ok. So you mean? Yeah, the, the one that you just showed. This? No. Thank you. Okay, so this is the, 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 the first next one. Graph. No. No? The mass redshift one. Yeah. With the completeness. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this one? Yeah, there are the relic also, but are, uh, yeah, mm, they are green as the non detection because yeah, I was uh, interested in the radio halo. So, no, really, I don't think I show something. Uh, uh, with the relic uh, in the redshift space. Okay. Uh, maybe here, but no, <laughs> no. Yeah, here, here is, yeah, this is the one where the radio relics. Yeah, there are also this triangle, yeah, here, but these are just those who, for which we have the morphological parameters. So, yeah, it's not very representative of all the sample. In the, the you see here, there are only, uh, a few of these triangles here. So, okay, thanks. <laughs> Sorry. Stella, I have a question. Do a quick question. Do you have uh, other band observations uh, besides the uh, uh, radio? And no, no, indeed, we are planning. We are already starting uh, uh, to investigate uh, this cluster also with uh, Gian Marti, because yeah, uh, the important point, as I already stressed in the talk, uh, is also to understand which is the spectral of these sources uh, and to understand if uh, there are a correlation between the kind of spectra and the dynamical status and uh, yeah, the scatter of the correlation and so on. But yeah, this is uh, something that we need to do. Thank you. Uh, other questions? So I think that if we do not have more questions, we can move to the gather tongue uh, and close this session.